Did you realize that the Old Testament law is not the way that God wants us to serve Him today? There's a new covenant. Today I'm going to be sharing some scriptures with you that will talk about how that we are totally free from the law. This will help you, so stay tuned for the Gospel Truth. Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that emphasizes God's unconditional love and grace. And now, here's Andrew. This week I've been uh, teaching a series that I've entitled The True Nature of God. And what all of this is about is trying to reconcile the grace and the mercy that we see from God, specifically through Jesus, with a lot of the judgment and the harshness from God that we see specifically through the Old Testament law. And uh, because both of these things are in the Bible and the Bible makes one book, a lot of people just kind of mix all of this together and they think that God is a vengeful, hateful, angry, tough, harsh God and a loving, kind God all at the same time. And they try and mix all of this together. And what it does, it at the very best, makes God look schizophrenic. And people just aren't sure if he's in a good mood or a bad mood today. But, you know, I've been trying to explain what the true nature of God is. And the Old Testament where the wrath of God was poured out was a temporary way of God dealing with mankind. It says this over in Galatians chapter 3, and as we go through this series, I'll go into more detail on this. But Galatians chapter 3 makes it very clear that the law was only temporary until Jesus should come. And so it was just a temporary measure. You know, if you were to take the entire span of time that the Bible covers from the fall of Adam until the present day. I figured this up not too long ago, and I forget the exact year, but it's around 5,956 years or something from the fall of Adam until our present time. So it's roughly 6,000 years. Uh, roughly the first 2,000 year period of time, God dealt with man's sins in uh, mercy. He didn't judge people. He didn't punish them. He didn't do things to them the way that we see under the Old Testament law. When the law came in roughly 2,000 years after the fall of Adam and Eve's sin, then there was a harshness from God and a judgment where the death angel would go out and destroy 186,000 men in Sennacherib's army in one night. And things like that would happen. And people were stoned to death for picking up sticks on the Sabbath day and doing all of these kind of things. Then Jesus came approximately 4,000 years after the fall of Adam and Eve. And since the time of Jesus, uh, from God's standpoint, we've been under a covenant of grace where it says in 2 Corinthians 5, 19, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing men's trespasses unto them. That means not holding men's sins against them. Or you could say not dealing with men according to their sins and hath committed unto us this same word of reconciliation. For the last 2,000 years, God is not angry with people because of their sins. God isn't dealing with you proportional to how holy you live. And yet the sad fact is that the vast majority of the church has not moved into this new covenant. The majority of people who call themselves Christians today are still trying to appease an angry God by their actions, promising that they're going to stop this and start doing this. And they're relating to God based totally upon their actions. That's an old covenant concept. And it's not the way we're supposed to relate to God today, but yet it is the way that most quote-unquote Christians relate to God. And as we go on through this series, I'm going to show you how that the Bible says the law works wrath. I believe that's Romans 4, 15. And the law is the strength of sin, 1 Corinthians 15, 56, 57. And so on and on we could go with this. The law actually is the agent of condemnation, guilt, uh, Romans chapter 3, verse 19, Romans chapter 8, verse 2. 
Other scriptures say all of those things. And so, because people are still trying to approach God with this Old Testament law mentality, that's the reason they're guilt-ridden. That's the reason they have no confidence, no boldness. They don't fully enjoy the love of God towards them because they feel condemned. And the truth is, we don't deserve the blessing of God. But the even better truth, the nearly too good to be true news is that we aren't getting what we deserve. God has set up a new method of dealing with people, and most Christians don't know about it. Let me go through a few more scriptures. I've already given some examples about where Elijah was trying to be emulated by the disciples of Jesus. They wanted to call fire down out of heaven, and Jesus rebuked them for doing what was done under the old covenant, saying, man, you don't know what manner of spirit you are of. You could have said it this way. You don't know what covenant you're living under. This isn't the way I deal with people anymore. And he rebuked his disciples for trying to do what Elijah did. Jesus totally did not execute the wrath and the judgment of God upon this woman taken in the act of adultery in John chapter 8, but instead he gave her mercy. And because, it's because there's a new covenant. And we've used a lot of different examples. Now here's some doctrinal stuff out of the book of Hebrews that is making some of these same points about the difference between the new covenant and the old covenant. And if I had time, we could teach the entire book of Hebrews. And it's a tremendous study. And this is what this book is all about. It's trying to teach people, come out from under the Old Testament law. Don't relate to God anymore on the Old Testament law. And he's making this point in every chapter, just all the way through. In Hebrews chapter 7, he had been making the point that Jesus isn't a priest under the Levitical priesthood because he didn't come out of the tribe of Levi. He came out of the tribe of Judah. And yet the scripture makes it very clear that the Messiah, Jesus, was going to be our priest, our high priest. So how did this work? This was contrary to the Old Testament law. He goes back and cites where David quoted that God was going to raise up a new priest after the order of Melchizedek. And so he's showing that Jesus is, a, is our high priest, but it's a total different priesthood than the Old Testament law. Therefore, he's using that as one of the proofs that the Old Testament law is no longer in effect over us today. That's the points that he's making. Now, you may not agree with that, but if you don't agree with it, then you don't agree with the book of Hebrews because that's the point that's being made in Hebrews chapter 7. And so in Hebrews chapter 7, uh, it says in verse... 15, and it is yet far more evident for that after the um, similitude of Melchizedek, there ariseth another priest who is made not after the law of a carnal ordinance, but after the power of an endless life. For he testifieth, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. In verse 18, it says, for there is verily a disannulling of the commandment going before for the weakness and unprofitableness thereof. Now that is a strong statement. And again, a lot of Christians just glaze over this, gloss over it. They just pass over it and don't think about what it means. This is talking about the Old Testament law because look in the next verse in verse 19. It says, For the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did by the which we draw nigh unto God. He is talking about the Old Testament law. And verse 18 says there is verily, the word verily means truly, a disannulling. Did you know that the word disannul means to cancel or void? And when you say disannul, it is just a strengthening of that, to say that there is a complete obliteration is the point that's being made. If you want to go study this out in some of the Greek lexicons and look this up, this is what it's talking about, a complete disannulling, a complete voiding, a complete destruction of the Old Testament law for the weakness and unprofitableness thereof. Now again, the law was good as far as it went, but compared to what we have through Jesus, in comparison, the Old Testament law is weak and unprofitable. And those who are trying to promote the law and telling us that we need to relate to God based on a performance-based mentality, that we've got to keep all of these rules and do everything right if we want to receive God's blessing or salvation or answer to prayer. Anybody who's preaching that is preaching something that is weak and unprofitable. 
And I'm not going to get over there and explain this completely, but if you went over to Romans chapter 8, you'll find out it says in verse 1, it says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. And then verse 3, it says, For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemns sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. Romans chapter 8 verse 3 says, For the weakness of the flesh we couldn't fulfill the law. So God sent his Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for flesh, condemns sin in the flesh. Talking about what? in the flesh of Jesus. The law itself isn't wrong. The law is right and holy and pure. Romans chapter 7 says that. But we weren't holy and pure. And because of our weakness and our unprofitableness thereof, the law really was not a good thing. It was something that condemned us. Nobody could ever approach unto God through their keeping of any rules and regulations. All the law has power to do is to condemn us and show us our need for God. And so the law was weak because we couldn't keep it. It was because of us that the law was weak. The law would have been fine if somebody could have lived up to it. The only person that ever did was Jesus. Jesus kept the law and earned the righteousness and the right favor of God. And now he makes it available to every one of us who will accept him by faith. Boy, that's good news. But this scripture where it says there is verily a disannulling of the commandment going before. Man, if words mean anything to you, that ought to mean that there is a difference between the old covenant and the new covenant. So I was sharing out of Hebrews chapter 7 verse 18 where it says that there is a complete disannulling or destruction of the law because we have something better. And that's what it says here in Romans chapter, Hebrews chapter 7, chapter 8, talks about this same thing and is contrasting the weakness of the Old Testament law with the power of the New Testament gospel. And let me just read a few more uh, verses here. In verse um, 7, this is Hebrews chapter 8, verse 7. It says, For if the first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. Now again, pay attention. Let words mean something to you. This is saying that the first covenant, the old covenant, if it would have been faultless, they wouldn't have, been, they wouldn't have ever sought or prophesied or talked about the coming of a new covenant. There is a difference between the covenants, the contracts, the way that God has dealt with people. And this is showing you that they aren't both in existence at the same time. The first covenant has been superseded. It has now been suspended. It has been taken over by the new covenant, and we are no longer under that old covenant way of relating to God. So back in Hebrews 8, 7, For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. But finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. But this is quoting an Old Testament scripture. So this concept of having a new covenant and an old covenant, the new covenant superseding, and replacing the old covenant, this isn't something that is brand new. Even the old covenant... The first covenant had these things in there. Jeremiah prophesied about it, and that's the reason he's quoting from Old Testament scriptures. So back in verse 9, it says, Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. You know, people nearly always interpret this as talking about that the Jews are going to be saved down to the very last person. The entire Jewish nation will eventually be saved. And you know what? I'm not saying that that won't happen, but I don't think that this is what this verse is talking about. And yet that's the way it's 
typically interpreted. I believe what this is talking about in this new covenant, God is going to put the law in our heart. And what it's saying is that nobody is going to have to tell us about the Lord. It's not going to be just mental understanding that we have about the Lord, but God himself is going to live in us, put his word in our heart, and nobody's going to have to teach us. We will know it by experience. We will be born again. We will all personally know the Lord from the least to the greatest. And this is talking about the church age that we live in today, that you can know the Lord intuitively. Now, your intuitive revelation of God will never violate what the Word says. But I'm saying it's not going to be just mental in exercise. It's not just facts that you've learned. But these facts may reveal something to you, but then you can experience it firsthand for yourself. You can know beyond any shadow of a doubt that you know God personally. Man, that's awesome. That's one of the awesome differences between true Christianity and religion. You know, other religions, they have doctrines, creeds, dogmas that they go by. People can discipline themselves and act a certain way. But there is no other religion on the face of the earth that can experience God the way that Christianity can. God comes and lives on the inside of us, and we know him from the least to the greatest is what this is talking about. And then it, look at this. It goes on to say in Hebrews chapter 8, and in verse 12 says, For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Boy, that is radical. You know, again, I, you know, most people don't let the Bible get in the way of what they believe. Most people just choose to believe something because it's what they want to believe or it's what they've been taught to believe. It's what tradition says. But most people don't really use the Bible as the foundation of their belief system. I'm praying that you'll change that. And according to Romans 3, 4, it says, Yea, let God be true, but every man a liar. I pray that you'll let God's word be truth in your life. And any tradition or dogma or creed that violates it, change it. Let God's word be absolute. This says, under this covenant that we're living under today, here are some of the precepts. I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Did you know that the average Christian today, person that calls himself a Christian, doesn't believe that? Most people believe that God is imputing sins unto them, that God is holding their sins against them. Don't look at me in that tone of voice. You know, if I could see you right now, I can guarantee you there's a lot of you say, oh, oh, no, I don't believe that. We do. For one thing, I've had to renew my mind and come out of this religious system myself, and I know how I used to think, and I deal with a lot of people. And I'm telling you, this is how the majority of people think. In my prayer lines, I've had people come up for healings by the thousands. I have prayed for tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of people. And it is typical for a person, when they're telling me what's going on, they say, I just don't know why God hasn't healed me. I pray, I fast, I study the Word, I pay my tithes, I go to church, I'm doing the best I can. Why hasn't God healed me? When a person says something like that, they're telling me why God hasn't healed them. What they're saying is, look what I've done. Isn't it enough? Why hasn't God healed me? They're pointing to what they have done for Jesus, believing that that earns them a response, an answer to prayer. But the truth is that it's not what we do for Jesus, it's what he's done for us. I don't have people come up to me and say, you know, I know that by the stripes of Jesus I'm healed and that he loves me and that it's already done. How come it's not manifest? I don't have that happen very often, but I have it happen all of the time where people tell me what they have been doing for the Lord and they're confused about why it hasn't worked. It's not what you do for the Lord. God doesn't answer your prayers and give you what you deserve. Man, you ought to be glad he doesn't or we'd all be a pile of ashes. We'd all be sick. We'd all be in trouble if God gave us what we deserve. This is saying that under the new covenant, God will be merciful to our unrighteousness and our sins and iniquities he will remember no more. 
I guarantee you there are some religious systems today that, boy, hold people's sins against them, and they never are going to forgive them for this. You are going to live as a second-class citizen for the rest of your life because you've had a divorce, because you've done this, because you've done this, and you've done this. Under the new covenant, God is going to be merciful to our unrighteousness and our sins and iniquities. He will remember no more. That's what the new covenant is. There is a difference between the way God dealt with sins under the old covenant and the way God deals with sins under the new covenant. Look at this in verse uh, 13. He says, In that he saith the new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. This is talking about the Old Testament law. The Old Testament law is that old thing that is ready to vanish away. Why hasn't it vanished away? Because the church is keeping it alive and keeping people under the law and telling us unless we keep all of these precepts, unless we do this, 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 God won't bless us. That's not true. That is not the New Testament message. I'm telling you that a lot of confusion about God and a lot of misrepresentation about God comes because people have seen a harshness and a wrath and a judgment of God under the old covenant. And they have just assumed that God is still that same way under the new covenant. The truth is, God doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. But His dealings with us have changed, not because He's changed. He's, he's not changed or made a difference in His nature. But we have changed. And God is now able to release his love and mercy towards us in ways that he wasn't before.